Hey guys, can you see me? Can you hear me? Hello guys, am I audible and visible? I hope I am. Hello Suresh, good evening. Good evening everyone. So if I'm audible and visible, just say me hi. How are you? You're seeing after quite some time in Pare series, right? So in the last class we did about lung, I think a couple of days back and uh, I show I'm good, hope you're doing good as well. And we'll be go continuing with GIT and hepatobiliary. So I have taken like uh, four or five important topics what, which I consider is important. Uh, one is about primary biliary cholangitis, primary biliary uh, cirrhosis and uh, hello Satika. And we'll be talking about the ulcers part in the GIT, benign and malignant. Uh, the chronic gastritis part of GIT because acute gastritis I'm sure you'll be taking care of it and you'll be managing that. The type A, type B, autoimmune and H. Parade, we'll go about the difference. We'll talk about inflammatory bowel disease, we'll talk about celiac disease and if time permits we'll be covering your adenocarcinoma as well, right? So these are the uh, quick update of what I'm going to talk today and uh, I feel GIT and hepato GIT especially is a place where you can easily create a clinical scenario. Uh, so you can expect an LAQ from GIT, be it your um, Crohn's disease or be it your ulcerative colitis or even your uh, chronic H. pyloric gastritis, right? They can give you a history of uh, that the patient had an uh, PCO transmission or something uh, wrong has been taken and has an, a chronic gastritis symptom of uh, ulcer. All those things can be given in an LAQ, right? So with that note, we'll quickly go on to the first question without wasting any time. So this can definitely come as a question. And if you are uh, seeing this for the first time and if you're learning this for the first time, you'll have very easy way to remember them and we'll easy way to recollect them as well right so what is the difference between a primary biliary cholangitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis right so uh, there are two types of cholangitis which can happen one actually involves the smaller vessel so the smaller uh, bile duct and other involves a bigger bile duct right so if you take bile duct architectures in general i'm just giving you a random overview of how the bile duct is architecture let's say there's a gross appearance of a liver with every hepatocyte, right, we have re le learned in the original lecture as well. Next to every hepatocyte, you have biliary canaliculi, right? So the canaliculi, everything here, joints completely from every part of the liver joints and forms the common bile duct. The hepatic duct, common bile duct and everything, right? So I have intrahepatic, I have extrahepatic bile ducts, common bile duct and then it automatically goes to your gallbladder joints and automatically goes to your uh, pancreas, the uh, ampulla of water, right? Good evening, Rajeshree. So this is the general architecture. So if I zoom this, I have bigger, larger bile ducts and also I have very, very tiny, tiny bile ducts, which is just adjacent to your hepatocyte, right? So this is the general architecture of the bile duct is seen in the liver grossly, right? So now with this information, we'll just go and slowly see and understand what happened in these two diseases, primary biliary cholangitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. And definitely we'll go and read the difference as well, right? So let's take primary biliary cholangitis first. See, both of them are autoimmune inflammatory disorder. That is uh, going ahead, right? Sure, IG. I like I said yesterday itself. I will be completing that in the month of November. Fine. Okay. So learn, and if you have any queries, like as usual, do comment. Fine. Okay. So we have primary biliary cholangitis. So the primary biliary cholangitis, what happens is it happens in an elderly person, and most of them are women. Like I said, it's an autoimmune disorder. Like most of them has to uh, will be involving women only, right? So let's say what is the proposed etiology is query viral infection or some random environmental antigen. We don't know what it is. This viral infection kind of damages the biliary epithelium. When it damages the biliary epithelium, the biliary epithelium, what it damages the epithelium of the smaller ducts. Because they are tiny ones and that's where the infections, if you remember the capillaries is where all the infection inflammation happens. That's where it goes and damages the epithelium of a smaller bile duct or biliary radical. So when it damages biliary radical, if you remember the autoimmune etiology or the general template, I'm having a, let's say same example, I've always used to give the same example. A pencil is there, virus comes and breaks the pencil. For me, there are two new parts, right? So my body thinks a broken antigen is a new antigen. So the virus breaks the epithelium of the biliary tract. So that creates something called a neo antigen, and this neo antigen against which I am going to have an auto antibody creation because it's a new antigen which is not developed in the thymus. So my lymphocytes will consider them as foreign, and this neo antigen, my B lymphocytes will produce antibodies. 
antibodies against the new antigen and it said that most of the cases the antibody is very very specific can anyone tell me what antibody it is i'll give you options try to choose it will it be anca or will it be anti mitochondrial antibody what antibody uh, what antigen against which the antibody will be produced right so here it will be antibodies again it will be an ama which is anti mitochondrial antibody okay to be very very specific perfect perfect healthy to be very specific it's actually against a complex of pyruvate dehydrogenase if you remember your biochemistry you had pyruvate dehydrogenase right so it's against the e2 complex of your pyruvate uh, dehydrogenase complex right against this complex the e2 part will have antibody production if you don't want to write pyruvate dehydrogenase completely fine at least remember it's an anti mitochondrial antibody right so i'm having an antibody against a tiny bilayer epithelium because that's where the new antigen started right so this antibody obviously will damage the bile ducts okay now i am going to ask you a very simple question so that we can understand the microscopic findings easily i'm destroying the bile ducts what do you think my body will do will it produce them back or it will be like okay fine will it produce them back obviously right any epithelium in my body is destroyed it will obviously come back right so when it damages the bilayer radical or a tiny small bile duct what it does is Let's assume this is a normal bile uh, portal triad. In the portal triad only you have the bile duct, right? I have bile duct, I have the hepatic artery, and I have the hepatic vein. Let me draw a green color for the bile duct, right? So that's how you have the normal portal triad: an artery, a vein, and a bile duct, right? So once this damage happens, what happens is the biliary epithelium proliferates, right? So the biliary epithelium becomes more and more and more and more and more and more. It proliferates. And what causes this damage? Can anyone answer? Who was the one who destroyed the biliary duct in the first place? Neutrophils, lymphocytes, eosinophils, macrophages. Who destroyed? The simple answer, right? I want you to be co you comment the answer. It's fine if you make a mistake, right? It'll be lymphocytes. It's an autoimmune disorder. So lymphocytes damages them. Lymphocytes destroys them, right? So can I say surrounding this lesion, I will also see lymphocytes? Obviously, right? Lymphocytes are seen as small round blue cells. Small round blue cells is where how a lymphocyte looks in a microscopy. So you'll have lots and lots of proliferating biliary epithelium, and in addition to that, you'll have lymphocytes surrounding them. Okay, these small round blue cells are lymphocytes. You can draw a diagrammatic description in your exam, so it gives you maybe a fetch you an extra mark, right? And also you have your biliary radical. So the small biliary radical will definitely proliferate, and this one I'm going to call it and I'm going to name it as a florid ductal lesion. Florid, more, ductal, reaction, that's all, right? So, there's a very diagnostic point in your primary biliary cholangitis. Florid, ductal lesion. Okay? So, this is my first response. I'll leave it to you. Now, you are going to answer me. I want everyone who's online to comment. It's fine if you're wrong. If you're wrong, if you feel it's, it's difficult, remove the comment, that's all, right? So, I had a florid ductal lesion. And having more biliary radical, will it create more antigen? Yes, right. So will the immune system fire up more because more new antigen, more antibody, secondary immune response, heightened response, right? So is there a possibility if the same thing continues at one point of time, the entire biliary radical or the portal triad will be destroyed? Is that right? Am I right in saying that at one point of time the entire biliary radical or portal triad will be destroyed? Possible, right? So what happens here is this gives more new antigen. When well, there's more new antigen automatically you'll have more antibodies antibodies will be produced which will be in excess and more and it'll end up in fibrosis okay it'll end up in complete fibrosis right so this fibrosis here will it damage the liver yes or no because this happens in the portal triad right it happens in the portal triad will it damage the liver or not it can damage the liver right so now i'm going to have fibrosis in the liver can I call it cirrhosis? Am I right in calling it cirrhosis? Obviously, I'm right in calling it cirrhosis. If, if I'm right in calling it cirrhosis, is this is it a primary cirrhosis due to the liver parenchymal problem, or is this a secondary biliary cirrhosis? This fibrosis will eventually go to the liver parenchyma. When it goes to the liver parenchyma, obviously it will cause cirrhosis, and this I'm going to call it a secondary biliary cirrhosis. It's going to be a secondary biliary cirrhosis, fine. So this is what I'm going to see in microscopy and I know the pathogenesis as well. It's a simple pathogenesis. Just few more points to just to fill up the tabular column, right? 
it is autoimmune disorder so it can be primary where it's an ama anti mitochondrial antibody sometimes can be a part of sle possible or sometimes can be associated with jogren syndrome hashimoto's possible right so here the only thing i'm going to see is the tiny 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 florid ductal lesion so when i take a biopsy of it i can see whatever microscopic finding smaller and medium sized intrahepatic ducts are involved larger ducts are not involved and florid ductal lesion is a classical pathogenesis right so we know about the primary biliary uh, cholangitis now let's look at primary uh, your sclerosing cholangitis right psc so we know about biliary cholangitis now you're going to look at primary sclerosing cholangitis this is one thing which is slightly altering from every autoimmune disorder or autoimmune inflammatory disorder we know right just tell me if i have any autoimmune disorder or inflammatory disorder which gender do you think will be more affected which gender do you think will be more affected obviously it will be perfect women right so this this is the only place where men will be so uh, women will be more commonly affected and this is the place where it will uh, it will be little bit more inclined towards male right so primary biliary cholangitis it happens little bit in an earlier age group and it can be little bit more commonly in men right males can be little bit more commonly affected fine right? so here it is said to be secondary to it's secondary to ulcerative colitis it is said to be secondary to ulcerative colitis. So, ulcerative colitis will be involved with ANCA antibody. Sorry. Okay. So, with secondary to ulcerative colitis, and ulcerative colitis will have P ANCA antibodies in them. So, ulcerative colitis is going to involve the intestine, right? It involves the intestine. So when it involves the intestine, uh, let's say I'm having an inflammatory bowel disease in the colon. So this colonic ulcerative colitis, the antibody from the colon will enter the blood circulation and from the blood circulation, the antibodies can go into your liver parenchyma, right? So let's assume from the ulcerative colitis, the antibodies here will enter into the circulation and into the circulation, they gain access into portal circulation from the systemic circulation you know how it can transfer and from that it automatically goes to your liver parenchyma if this is true tell me which part of the biliary system do you think the antibody will first gain access to the bigger ducts or the smaller ducts keep in mind that they are coming from they can access the portal venous system right so if it's going to enter via porta hepatis that's a route of entry bigger ducts will be first affected or smaller ducts Obviously, it will affect larger radicals. The reason why the larger bile radicals or bile ducts are affected is the route of entry here is, is from the intestine. From the intestine, it enters and it damages the larger bile ducts, right? So, since it damages the larger bile ducts and it's going to damage from the outside. So, because why from outside is, let's say I'm having a bile duct here and the blood supply will come from here, right? The blood supply comes from here. When blood supplies come from the outside, it has to damage the outer half first, right? Let's take any biliary epithelium. I'll have your biliary epithelium in the center. Then I have basement membrane and then you have the wall. Wall is made of the smooth muscle and few fibrous tissue. So here, the damage comes from the outside. First, I'm going to hit the smooth muscle and the fibrous tissue. So when you hit the smooth muscle and fibrous tissue first, from the outside, entire fibrous tissue is going to encase and it's going to compress the biliary radical, right? So what happens is, if you draw a cross section, this is your biliary epithelium. Let's draw it in green color. The biliary epithelium and the blood vessel comes from outside. The damage happens from outside. The fibrosis happens from outside. So over the period of time, am I right in saying that this fibrosis can completely obstruct the parenchyma or the lumen? It can, right? So this fibrosis, over the period of time can completely obstruct the lumen so when it obstructs the lumen it looks like an onion skin lesion right that's a very classical finding onion skin lesion is a very very classical finding of primary sclerosing cholangitis the only reason why i'm having onion skin is the damage happens from the outside and not from the inside i'll just go up for a second if you look at this 
here the damage starts from the epithelium from the inside so it destroys proliferated so here the damage is starting from the outside so more and more in fibrosis more and more in compression and it will be destroyed right that's how it happens here so when it happens from the outside the larger ducts are affected i'll have lots of fibros fibrosis in and around the by larger biliary ducts you'll have onion skin lesion there's one more finding once this onion skin lesion goes away fibrosis complete collagen will be there that's also sometimes called as an tombstone scar okay it's called as an tombstone scar the entire it'll be like an uh, memory of the old biliary radical being present there entire thing completely gone fibrosis completely scars scars will remodel and only scar will be seen i will not see any biliary tissue at all because the compression comes from the outside right here i'll have i might have granulomas you might have lymphocytes in the early onset right so tombstone scar will be there and plus lymphocytes can be seen because it's an autoimmune disorder it's anca mediated right at the end of the day right in this patient the ama when you take serology of this patient all of them started with anca right so p anca will be predominantly present here because ulcerative colitis has p anca anti mitochondrial antibody which is positive in case of an primary biliary cholangitis might be maximum 5% here predominantly it's anca based only ama as well as ana is more or less 5% can be associated that's all fine okay now we have to look at the radiological appearance because when you come to your uh, point here most of these disorders will be diagnosed with the help of radiology right let's see our radiological appearance will look in case of an ana or your anti mitochondrial or uh, your primary sclerosing cholangitis right so here i'm having a larger duct just for an example that a blood vessel came here and a blood vessel came here and both of them had anca antibody in them came and destroyed so what happens here is just for an understanding I'm having fibrosis surrounding this and having fibrosis surrounding this. Okay. Let's maybe if you want, you can increase it a little bit more. So it's intermittent. So intermittently, the antibodies are destroying them and they're compressing the biliary duct, larger biliary duct. So is there a possibility this can become a little bit projected because of the intense internal pressure, right? I'm having closed in on both sides. Obviously, in between one will swell a little bit. So when I do a radiological study, like an ERCP, right? So your retrograde cholangiograms, you need to do an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. Here I will see an beaded appearance because of the same reason. I have a constriction, then a normal, then again a constriction, right? So it looks like this, normal and then a constriction. So these places are the constricted ones where the tide doesn't go, okay? And the one in between the swollen one is a normal um, duct which is still patterned. That's what happens in case of an, sorry, a beaded appearance in case of an ERCP is diagnostic of a primary sclerosing cholangitis, right? Now let's go and see what the Fare book has. This is a table from Fare, right? The age group and everything. Now let's go to the pathogenesis. So what we read in the pathology was, it was a small to medium size. That's what we read for primary biliary cholangitis. That's right. Okay. And here, I have an extra hepatic larger ducts because of the primary sclerosing cholangitis comes from the intestine comes from the outside right the larger ducts are generally not involved in case of an pbc it's not involved in psc it's going to be fibrotic of sometimes medium and small intrahepatic duct also can be fibros what the larger ducts are done with because against a blood vessel the blood vessel if it's i'm having a blood vessel coming here gives 10 antibodies there's a possibility for the smaller ducts, I can have a little bit of at least one or two antibodies. Not the first finding, a little bit later finding, fine. If it affects the smaller ducts, yes, I might have ductular reaction there as well. Onion skinning is diagnostic, never ever forget this. And associated with Jogren's, it can be associated with SLE, it can be associated with any other autoimmune disorder. Here, IBD, like I said, to be specific, ulcerative colitis, fine. Serology, you'll have AMA positivity in case of a PBC and ANCA positivity in case of a PSC. Right? Radiological feature is the beaded appearance as we saw. Okay? So that's a quick look about primary biliary cholangitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. I just we explained, we understood it, and just we saw in the form of a table. Fine. <clears throat> okay. Now let's go to little bit of Barrett's esophagus. I'm sure you guys know about Barrett's, right? 
So I just want your help to you just tell me what is Barrett's. Let's go and learn about Barrett's if I guess, fine. What type of metaplasia is Barrett's? Can anyone start with that? It's the easiest question what I can answer. What type of metaplasia is Barrett? Barrett's is columnar metaplasia, right? It's absolutely a columnar metaplasia. Barrett's, what's the risk factor for Barrett's? That's Shri Aditi, what's the risk factor for Barrett's or medical fever? The risk factor for Barrett's is absolutely your GRD. See, GRD being a risk factor of Barrett's, I'll be more than happy if you are in the first half of the second year. When you are in the university exam, I want a little bit more specific answer, right? Smoking doesn't cause Barrett's, right? Smoking is, yes, smoking can cause GRD. GRD in turn can cause Barrett's. It's an indirect link, right? So instead of writing GRD, I would say, I would be more than happy if you're included chronic untreated GRD okay if it's a chronic untreated GRD that's the one which is going to cause Barrett's esophagus than your smoking smoking can predispose to GRD if these words are there I'll understand that okay you've also started going to surgery postings because GRD is what you must have read in pathology when you go to Barrett's and uh, your GRD are more of a surgical problem when you go to surgery, you'll read in depth about it, right? So when you have a chronic untreated GRD, once in a while, it's not going to cause Barrett's esophagus at all. So here, there'll be more amount of acid in your esophagus. Can you tell me what is the lining epithelium of esophagus? Anyone? The lining epithelium of esophagus is squamous, right? It's lined by squamous epithelium. So when you have squamous epithelium, which lines esophagus and acid goes to the squamous epithelium, right? So if the acid is going to go to the squamous epithelium, what will happen? Obviously, acid will burn squamous epithelium. It's an acid. How do we neutralize acid? How do you neutralize acid? We neutralize it with base. Basic secretion is bicarbonate. Can anyone tell me what's a bicarbonate with secretion in our body? It is obviously your intestinal secretion right so what happens here is the acid in the esophagus the squamous epithelium will be burnt or it will be injured so there is a need for me okay there's a need to neutralize acid so for me to neutralize acid you need a base or you need bicarbonate you need mucus right there's a need for mucus because once the mucus comes it obviously will neutralize acid so I can save the esophagus from getting burnt or getting injured in a chronic problem, right? So what's this epithelium which secretes mucin? Squamous epithelium cannot secrete mucin, right? So since I need a mucus, it changes to columnar epithelium. Okay? It changes to columnar epithelium and the columnar epithelium obviously will secrete mucin, right? Great dream doctor. So now can anyone tell me which part of columnar epithelium secretes mucus if the epithelium in the columnar cells or any particular cells everything or anything particular obviously it is only the goblet cells right perfect so only goblet cells are the one which is going to secrete mucin right great so here the goblet cells secretes mucin and that mucin neutralizes the GRD's acid and I will be safeguarding the esophagus. That's a primary rule. It's an adaptive response. It's a cell adaptation, right? So now, this is what I call it in Barrett's esophagus. So I have different terms. I can call it an columnar metaplasia. I can call it an glandular metaplasia. Or I can call it an goblet cell metaplasia, right? All these are different, different names for Barrett's esophagus, right? These are different names for Barrett's esophagus, right? So when I have these metaplasias, my esophagus is going to be safeguarded. So obviously the symptom, so since it's a uh, university exam, the structure is very important. You wrote the pathogenesis, obviously you have to write the clinical symptom, okay? It's a long-term GRD. That's the one which causes Barrett's esophagus, right? It's a long-term GRD. This gives rise to heartburn. 
heartburn will be the commonest symptom of barrett's esophagus because gerd causes heartburn it's a, it's a recurrent burning uh, burning sensation in the heart fine again sometimes you can also write in addition that might be the heartburn can go till the throat you can have laryngitis also you can have an uh, if you have burped sometime definitely have you tasted some uh, taste in your mouth when you burp that salty taste right that sore taste is also important right a sore taste after burp is actually a very classical finding for your GERD because the patient is not going to come and tell you heartburn patient will say I'll have pain in the retrosternal area and the sore taste in the mouth because the reflexed acid obviously gives the sore taste to the mouth right so now you have to diagnose I suspect Barrett's esophagus and we diagnose Barrett's esophagus so when you diagnose Barrett's esophagus the first step is endoscopy okay you do an endoscopy and then you diagnose Barrett's esophagus fine right? just when you put an endoscopy what we have to see is let's assume this is your normal esophagus okay and you have your stomach normal esophagus is about 25 centimeter and you guys only said that it's lined by squamous epithelium there's one more term for squamous epithelium we also call it stratified squamous epithelium right it's not just normal squamous it's a stratified squamous epithelium stratified means multi layers so let's say my squamous epithelium is like this multiple layers like stratum basal to stratum corneum and I have one more epithelium called as an columnar epithelium what's that's what is getting replaced by columnar epithelium is a single layer a single layer columnar epithelium right am I right in saying that both epithelium in the sub epithelial space you'll have blood vessels yes obviously you'll have blood vessels in the sub epithelial space so when you have blood vessels in the sub epithelial space perfect dream rocker doctor sorry the epithelium blood vessel of this squamous epithelium will be not much visible so the epithelium looks paler in color on the other hand the blood vessel of the columnar epithelium which is very thin single layer it's more visible right so when the columnar epithelium starts coming the columnar epithelium becomes more red in color right so when you have a red color epithelium in a pale normally esophageal mucosa is pale and when you see a red color epithelium in the esophageal mucosa the velvety one the name is given for your mucin secretion that's all reclimer good evening okay so it'll have a red velvet like mucosa that's a classical finding for barrett's esophagus right red velvet like mucosa so when the surgeon puts in barrett's esophagus he or she is uh, eso your uh, endoscopy he or she will definitely say it is barrett's esophagus or not it's not a difficult thing to suspect barrett's esophagus now i'll have to different or you'll have to classify barrett's esophagus based on the length of the segment involved does anyone know how do we classify barrett's based on the length of the segment involved you have something called some short segment barrett's and you have something called some long segment barrett's both are same right so if it is less than three centimeter let's say that this is your j junction if it is involvement is less than three centimeter from j junction we call it jg for j junction we call it short segment barrett's esophagus if it's more than three centimeter, even if it involves the entire esophagus, it's a long segment Barrett's esophagus. Okay. So since I know it's Barrett's esophagus, can we go to treatment straight away or should we do something else? Good evening, Sanjay. Can we start treatment straight away or should we intervene and do something else? We cannot start treatment straight away, right? Because there is a possibility that I might this might be becoming a malignancy, right? you have to take a biopsy so when the surgeon gives a biopsy from the junction generally it's from the junction of the squamous columnar junction we'll take a biopsy the purpose of biopsy in barrett's esophagus is not to confirm because confirmation is more or less done when the endoscopy you see a red velvety mucosa no other condition you're going to have seen red velvety mucosa right perfect you do a biopsy so when you do a biopsy how to identify barrett's esophagus in a microscopy again same thing multi-layer and a single layer right i suggest hope you're doing good and hope you're preparing well for your exams as well right then multiple layered stratified squamous epithelium that will be there on one side and you'll have columnar epithelium columnar epithelium generally will form glands the easiest way to pick up columnar epithelium is the gland formation and the easiest way to pick up squamous epithelium is the 
multiple stratified epithelium that's the easiest way to pick up squamous epithelium fine so now i'm right in saying that cuboidal epithelium can also form glands is that right cuboidal epithelium also can form glands right obviously it can also form glands so how do i differentiate this is not a cuboidal epithelium with glands alone i cannot differentiate can a cuboidal epithelium produce mucin yes no cuboidal epithelium does not produce mucin right cuboidal epithelium is an inactive one it's not secretory only columnar epithelium can produce mucin so it is imperative for me to identify if this is a columnar or cuboidal so i need to identify the mucin secretion right so here if i see goblet cells i'll be more than happy to call it an columnar epithelium i'll be more than happy to call it an rhc esophagus if i'm not able to vis visually see goblet cells what i do is a stain for mucin i use a stain for mucin if the mucin stain is positive obviously i can easily extrapolate okay the mucin secreting epithelium has to be a columnar so this gland forming epithelium cannot be cuboidal because it's not always possible to see goblet cell even if you look in your intestine where you see goblet cells you will not see them continuously it's discontinuous so in the section if i'm not able to see goblet cells i use stain for mucin right so if i use stain for mucin there are two stains one is called as pas other is alcyon blue this completes my diagnostic workup of barat so because i have one more important thing i'll continue soon right so i have to see in the microscopy multiple layers like you guys said and the glands for columnar epithelium and if it's pa is positive or alcyon blue actually barat is positive for both if any one of them is positive i'll be more than happy to call it columnar line esophagus or barat's esophagus i want you to answer one more thing uh, write one more thing especially in an exam uh adesh what is the color of pas do you mention it's a brown pas is generally in magenta color stain right it's a dark pink color alcyon blue is it gives blue color fine right? is magenta color dark pink color something of that sort fine right? okay so here i just wanted to write in the diagnosis generally when i am going to see a barat's esophagus in a microscopy i don't write it as barat's esophagus the way for me to write is columnar lined esophagus it's oesophagus right that's how the technical terms come right so write clo that's a classical diagnosing for columnar lined esophagus okay So I know it's a columnar line esophagus because this is the latest WHO approved terminology. Rather than reporting Barrett's, I use the term columnar line esophagus. The older term was intestinal metaplasia. If you want to mention, you can mention it, right? Like I said, my workup is not yet complete. So my only reason, the surgeon must have done a biopsy is to see if it has become a carcinoma or not, right? The next thing for me is I have to look for dysplasia. If dysplasia is present or not is the next question. Has to be seen, right? If you have been with me in the lectures of neoplasia, you must have definitely known how to identify dysplasia. There are just four findings: pleomorphism, INC ratios, mitosis, and loss of polarity, right? Uh, that's what I'm saying, Aditya. We are continuing with that. If you have any these four findings, these are the classical findings of dysplasia. Pleomorphism means different morphology of the cells. A high NC ratio. Uh, high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio that's the second atypical mitosis or an increase in number of mitosis that's a third and i have loss of polarity so if you have all these findings i suspect that there could be a dysplasia again when there's a dysplasia i'm going to bifurcate them into low grade dysplasia and high grade dysplasia See, you actually need not comment on low grade or high grade dysplasia that's my job i will be commenting on what is low grade and high grade dysplasia if you can just mention if these four findings are seen i can say it's dysplastic based on few parameters i will say low grade or a high grade the reason why a low grade and high grade dysplasia is required is this i want you to answer this i want you to write in the exam hall low grade dysplasia is reversible high grade dysplasia is irreversible the reason why this i need to know is if it's a low grade dysplasia with barrett's esophagus still proton pump inhibitor is my treatment i don't do anything else 
I'll do give proton bump inhibitor. If it's high grade dysplasia, I might require to think in terms of an surgical removal of the esophagus because in irreversible condition, I might know do that. Fine. Okay. So that's about Barrett's esophagus. Okay. Okay, so, uh, I have a bit of an health emergency. Someone close to me is not well. So I think I'll take a break now. And I would definitely want to complete the entire uh, rest of the GIT again. Maybe tomorrow in the little bit around uh, 5 o'clock or something before the original foray. I'll cover the rest of it. Fine. Sorry to get a drain, take a rain check. I feel I should be there with the person right now. Fine. Sorry, apologies. I am not able to continue. Like I said, I'll be definitely talking about your uh, ulcers, benign malignant ulcers. And we'll be talking about your uh, inflammatory bowel disease, gastric carcinomas and intestinal carcinomas. Fine. Yes, Ajit. Uh, sorry for it. I will uh, end it for now. I'll definitely do the rest of the GIT and hepatobiliary as part 2 in the link. I'll definitely continue that uh, in the next half. Fine. Maybe tomorrow um, around evening I'll do that. Fine. Sorry. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye.